What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another Timmons podcast. I'm your host, Timmon. This is my podcast, guys. Real conversations with authentic people, and I've got an authentic person that I want to introduce you here today. AJ uh, and I go way back. We get into it on the podcast, but he is just a wonderful individual. I'm so thankful for him, and I'm very thankful for the way that he creates authentic communities in anywhere he's planted, honestly. Um, but I can really see that's his heart, and he does a really good job of pulling people together uh, and just caring about um, specific things, whether it's uh, environmental or um, outside of that. He just really cares for the people in his area, and I really appreciate him for coming on, talking. Uh, we'll get into that. He's got a ton of different stuff. Let's get into some business real quick. Let me get that, get that out of the way. One, uh, we've got a YouTube. Probably watch this on YouTube. Maybe not, but for sure, check us out. Timmons podcast on YouTube. Uh, that little community is growing, which is really exciting. And then also Timmons podcast on Twitter. Um, that's pretty stagnant. Not a lot of people are following me there. So not a lot actually does go on there. So maybe follow me at Nymphs TJ on Twitter as well. Uh, that's my personal one. I think that's the most active I am on any social media is on that pot on that uh, social media on Twitter X Twitter. Next. Okay. Well, enough of business. For sure, check me out there. Like, subscribe, all that fun stuff, guys. Uh, let's get to AJ. AJ, thanks for coming on, brother. here welcome aj to the timmons podcast thanks for having me the goshen experience the podcast of goat i don't know <laughs> dude yeah thanks for thanks for coming man we've been i've been wanting to podcast with you for a while but then you um what did i say uproot would that be the right word no you transplanted transplanted yeah 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 the roots are still here i do have roots here you still have roots here and I wasn't able to catch you in time because uh, it was a whirlwind. It was so fast. Once I started announcing that I was leaving, I had to start uh, getting rid of things, trying to figure out who was taking over what responsibilities as far as the garden, as far as the worm farm, yeah. as far as setting up things with the CRC and my job. Yeah. Um, there's a lot to succession plan. Yeah. Yeah. And you were kind of on a timeline, too. Yeah. Uh, a shorter timeline than probably expected. Yeah. And you're like, okay, well, I got it. And then you are traveling <laughs> three days or whatever it was. Yeah, to... three days of mishaps. So oh, no day way. one, um, so day one, I leave here. Well, day zero, I'm trying to pack and get everything in my van. And I just realized that, like, I have overestimated how much I can get in my van. <laughs> I just need to leave things in the apartment. Oh, wow. Like, cleaning Phoebe Damned, I, at some point, it's just money. Yeah. And I need to leave. Um, so I uh, ended up leaving later than I wanted to. I wanted to leave um, on a Thursday. I ended up having to just stay the night because it was it was too late on Thursday for me to drive safely. Yeah. So I stayed the night, left Friday morning, um, went and picked up my dad in Illinois, and then we were driving and we were to Iowa when um, one of the tires oh, no. uh, just started like wobbling. Oh, and it sounded no. like we had a flat and I looked back and I was like, oh yeah, we have a flat. Cause I was looking in the mirror and I saw the, the tire uh, just going all crazy. Oh gosh. So he pulls over and I look over and I'm like, it, it's not flat. Like it's the same, like it looks the same as the other tire. And so I go around and look at all of them and we're looking at the sensor. The sensor is not going off. I'm like, what is, what is going on? So I was like, Hey, uh, drive forward slowly. And he immediately gets like 15 miles an hour, which is, I meant like three miles right. an hour. Right. Um, but I see one of the tires is like wobbling back and forth oh. as we're going forward. And so then we're like, we'll replace it with a spare. We don't know what's going on. Um, we try, we, we jack up the car and then, um, we realize that there's only one lug nut left. Oh my word. Yeah. So there's, there's one lug nut left on this tire, like holding it all in. Oh my. If it weren't for that wobbling and us being like, we need to pull over now, you could a lot. we, it could have been a lot worse for, our lives. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when you're going like 80, I'm guessing right. 80, 90 or whatever that yeah. main road is. And just like zooming. on the highway. Just yeah. Flying. And then there goes your tire. Yeah. Thankfully we were able to get into a place. They, uh, we got a tow truck. We got to a place that was open. They stayed open about a half hour later than they would have just to get us back on the road. Like that's thank cool. God that we were able to do that. Yeah. 
that was the mishap of day one. <laughs> mishap of day two. So um, we're going across Kansas. We're going across, um, oh, the one with all the mountains, Colorado. We're going yes. through Colorado. And all of a sudden, the tires or the, the brakes don't sound right. Oh, and no. I'm kind of not sure if I want to say anything. Because sometimes you feel like if I don't say anything, it's not real. It's right. not going to be a problem. Right. Turn the music up. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and then I was then I sort of mentioned something. And then my dad's like, no, that's fine. Sometimes it brakes just sound like that. And then I'm like, no, brakes should not sound like this. The sound is the vehicle telling us that something is wrong. We need to pull over. So we pull over. We get the brakes figured out turns out we were burning up the brakes going down the mountains right so the the um mechanic told us how to use the air brake which i hadn't actually done before oh interesting um yeah i, I haven't needed to use the engine brake in indiana so right. uh going through mountains you have to use the engine brakes or then you'll overheat the brakes and i don't know you die or something right no or no brakes which could be really rough on some of those they have those pull-offs in case you do, but I mean... They are too far apart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we're able to able to fix that, um, which again, set us back several hours. Right. And then day three, we are getting into California. We're getting into Los Angeles. Well, mishap A is the AC has gone out. Oh, no. So we stop past Las Vegas. We, get, we stop for a lot... We stopped for lunch in Las Vegas. That's awesome. That's cool. Um, then we're between Las Vegas and Los Angeles, and the AC is out, and I you're in the desert. I can't handle it. Like my body makes me pass out. Oh wow! Um, and then my dad's able to drive to like the Auto Zone or whatever, and gets more AC coolant or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So we're able to recharge it, so like we can exist in the van. Then we continue, and we're getting into Los Angeles. We're in the suburbs. We're just past West Covina. And uh, we pop a flat. Oh, my word. This time it is a flat for real. <laughs> no, um, like that's gone. Yeah. And it, it starts it starts off really slow. I think I hit a piece of glass or something on the highway. Um, and so it's just like leaking. And I can see the meter going down oh, like two no. PSI every every time it blinks. So I end up being able to, to pull into the nearest gas station um, to see if I can just pump it up. Um, yeah. The pump doesn't work because uh, we looked at where the gas station was on Google Maps. Google Maps didn't realize that this gas station isn't functioning. Oh. But it was right across from a tire repair place. Oh, so yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah. They probably went in and plugged it real quick and you're good to go or Yeah, I mean it was it was longer than I thought it should have taken, but it was it was pretty quick all in all. Yeah. And so then we're able to make it into Los Angeles into where my apartment's at um but yeah, a mishap each of the 3 days. Oh my goodness. Yeah, just like don't go, don't go, don't go, <laughs> or barrier, 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 or yeah. who knows what. Yeah, hard to hard to figure out what sense to make out of that, or to like just pause and like don't read too much into it. Yeah, well, you made it. I did. You know, I did, and I made it alive. There's a reason why things were uh, obstructing you to get there or whatnot. And you've been there for a couple months now. Yeah, I was just doing the math, and I think it's about four and a half. Wow. Yeah, just yeah. living the dream. How in. Uh, California. Now, let's let's step back. Let me tell a little people like how we met, mm -hmm. maybe, and then we. I'd love to go back to like what you're doing now. Yeah, if that's cool. But we connected first time I remember um, really talking to you was at Jess, Jesse's uh, garden. Do you remember that that party? I don't know. It was like a neighborhood. Of was meeting. that a pizza party? Pizza party. Yeah. yeah. I started talking to you there, and then. Um, I don't know how we became friends or if, or if you posted on the East Lincoln Crossing Facebook page that you're doing garden stuff. And this was like two years ago or a year ago. It was it maybe a year ago. Yeah, just over a year ago. And um, I saw that and my Allison and I were talking about doing garden stuff. And so I'm like, we should go help AJ out. And so uh, I think I messaged you a couple of times or let's at least told you I was interested. And then I, I think I messaged you again saying, hey, when can we come out and help? And that's the real first time we actually got to hang out and talk was when we all were gardening, digging the trench. No, the trench was dug. I think I was putting in um, what are those orange flowers along the trench. That was the oh, first marigolds. marigolds. Yeah. Yeah. I had you putting in marigolds along the trench. That was good. That was, that was the first day. We were just hanging out and talking. And then from there, we just did a bunch of garden stuff. And yeah. our friendship blossomed <laughs> from there. Yeah. I I think I think I, I – 
I mean, to to admit, to apologize, I think I, I took our friendship from granted for granted like right away um, that summer. So so we worked, we were gardening a lot through yeah. that spring. Um, that summer, uh, I feel like was just a little harder to schedule. Um, and I was also, I was going through it. I, yeah. I was um, in kind of a depressive episode and I was not uh, planning as many uh, uh, work days for folks to come and garden with me. Um, and then I think after I skipped about two, cause I was just not feeling it, I realized how much chatting with you in the garden was, was really benefiting me and how much, how valuable that friendship was. Yeah. Well, it's, we were just talking about that at lunch today about how you were talking about the drug stuff and mm. we forget about the, the, the conversations with friends. Yeah. You can't put that in drug form. You know, that's such a needed thing. And it's able to bounce ideas. And for me, when I'm talking to people, like my mind unwinds. I'm able to see things that I may have not thought about or talked about. I'm like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. You know? Yeah. That's, that's good stuff. In, in the invitation to talk with people, there's the the working it out that we do when we try to put things into words. Mm -hmm. That we just, that, that, that happens internally. Um, and there's also the fact that people can give you advice or ask yeah. you questions that reframe it. But I think yeah. like... I think we we overlook all of those values so much and like only think the value will be advice, not that the person's going to help you reframe the issue right. so that you can fix it at yourself or that even just in describing the issue, maybe you immediately know what you need to do. Right. Or just listen. Sometimes it's good to have someone just to hear you. Like <laughs> that's very sentimental. I'm action oriented. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, good stuff. yeah. I totally feel that too. There's the problem. Let's fix it. Here we go. Yeah. If I fix the problem, I'll feel better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it, it was cool too, because I love what you are doing with that spot. And we loved the, this, the, it was a blank field mm -hmm. when we first got there and then it just started. Well, I think the trench was there and the horseshoe, mm -hmm. but just started kind of blossoming into this cool thing. And you, you know, I, I've talked about, yeah, I just think it's needed to be connected back to the, to the earth and back to food being grown and, and stuff like that. And you're doing that. And we've learned so much from all the stuff that you've, you've got a wealth of knowledge when it comes to gardening. I don't know how or where you learned it all, but you've got this like deep level of knowledge Thank um, you. and you were applying it. It was cool to see how you were applying it to all the different things. But, um, yeah. So what, what, how'd that come about the garden? Let's maybe talk, mm. talk a little bit about that. Cause it's this lot that's right next to the overpass. There was a house there. I'm pretty sure at one point. Yeah. So the, the house came down because when the overpass came in, the, um, the right of way for the overpass extended into the property line and extended into where the, the house was. Mm. Um, so the house wouldn't have been able to stay there. Right. So they demolished the house, um, and then um, the owner retained ownership of the part of the property that was outside of the right of way, okay. <laughs> which is now like this weird, funky shape. Yeah. You can't put a house on it. You can't really develop it in any meaningful way. Yeah. Um, it's like a triangle, like a weird yeah. triangle-y thing. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Right next to the tracks. Like you, I remember the first time you're like, no one would want to have a house here because it is so loud. It is. It's, Yeah. Like you, in the course of an hour, there's easily like three times that you get interrupted. Right. For like two minutes each time. Right. Yeah. You can't say anything. You just sit. Yeah. Look at each other. And then we go back it. to the kind of <laughs> And then you, you try to talk and then it, it goes again. Yeah. You, you thought it was done, but you were wrong. Deception. <laughs> it's usually right when you have something very important to say too. You're like, and this is when he, and you're like, okay, well, I can't tell you now. Like, yeah. <laughs> the universe decided I'm not allowed to say that. <laughs> like, dang it. Well, you wait and then you say, it, you say it a little bit more gracefully, right? Because you've had time to think about it for two minutes or who knows. But. Well, no, I've just been fuming for two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, that I got that, that garden, but um, I feel like I have to talk about it backwards. Go for it. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm very passionate about peace and justice and thinking about how to, how to live in a world that's fair and just and how to make, um, how to, how to live justly. Um, and as I was studying, I had a classmate who was really into, um, describing the earth as healing and talking about, um, how much 
like working with the ground is a part of um, living well, living correctly, the way that humans should be living. And so that was sort of a seed in the back of my head. Um, I, I started my career doing victim offender mediation, and then I had a classmate who was heading up an urban garden, an urban garden at a food pantry. Hmm. And then she hired me on to um, teach the youth interns. And I was like, ooh, 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 we are going to sneak in some restorative justice. I've also been meaning to grow things with um, in the earth and be more grounded. Yeah. So that was that was the right moment there. And so you mentioned that I have this wealth of knowledge, but um, I got that job at the beginning of 2020. So I took the material she had and I dove into it. I watched all of YouTube. I read half of the articles, um, half the academic articles, three quarters of all the folk articles of people just saying their their uh, experience. Yeah. Um, one of one of the catchphrases I sort of developed is I didn't come here to fuck around. <laughs> so I I pretty quickly um, learned a ton just from like immersing myself in all that I could read, all that I can listen to yeah. and then practicing as well. Yeah. And so I'm doing that and I'm doing that in Elkhart and I keep looking out my back door of my apartment and I see this this lot, this funky triangle, like you said, just sitting there. I'm like, who owns that? Can I garden on that? Yeah. Um, and so I, I continued doing teen growers for a while. Um, I worked at another farm, Bushel Craft, which is about connecting people to the ground, getting people growing um, and helping people eat more local food mm -hmm. um, for for environmental and social reasons and nutritional reasons, too. Yeah. So I have now continue to really like dive into these different aspects of it. The soil science, the history um, of like colonization, our current farming practices, farming practices of indigenous people, of black people. How do we, how do we effectively do agriculture at the human scale without heavy machinery? Mm. Um, so this is what I've been focusing on for a long time. So I finally am able to buy this garden and I start it and I, I just like invite friends to come with me. And so that's how I, I mean, so that's the story of both how I got that garden and how I learned um, along the way, the things that Different. set me up to be able to start it. Yeah. Do you think it's doable to, to go, go to scale, to garden at scale? What do you mean by that? Like um, industrial farming feeds so many people. Do you think that it's possible for uh, that to be replaced with um, more sustainable? I mean, <laughs> it's going to have to at some point. I feel like, but right. do you think do you think we have the ability to to get to that level where it's not uh, super chemical heavy in order to grow food? Yeah. So starting with the starting starting with the end, we're going to have to. Yeah. Um, I think so philosophically in the abstract future, we're going to have to. Yeah. Specifically in Indiana, there have been a number of springs where um, things melted at a weird time and then there were lots of rains and heavy machinery could not get into the fields. Mm. So we weren't able to have a good corn crop or we weren't able to have a good uh, soy crop because we could not use heavy machinery because they were sinking in the fields. Wow. And the I mean, earth was literally eating. <laughs> yeah. And that's going to get no worse with, with climate change. Yeah. Um, because we're going to have more mild winters and wetter springs. Mm. So that's only going to get worse. It's only going to become less possible to feed ourselves with heavy machinery. Yeah. Um, and well, if the ground, also the nutrients gets pulled from it, uh, of course it's going to be something that can just, water runs right through it and it just yeah. soaks. Yeah. So like, I mean, at the human scale, we have rain boots. Hmm. Um, yeah. There's there's not the equivalent of like rain boots for heavy machinery sinking into the ground. Right. Um, so, in in a in a more uh, in the near future, um, it's going to become a lot more effective to do this at the human scale than it is at the heavy machinery scale, hmm. especially in northern Indiana. Um, so I was I was recently speaking with. Um, some folks were coming through the garden that I work at now and I was showing them the three sisters we were growing. Uh, the three sisters is an indigenous polycrop method where you're growing 
corn, bean, and squash together. Mm -hmm. The corn grows tall and is a pole, and the beans love crawling up poles, and beans put nitrogen in the soil, and corns love to gobble up lots of nitrogen. And then the squash covers the ground and helps um, protect from pests Mm. and also makes it easier to weed because the weeds aren't getting as much sun because the ground's shaded, and it's also retaining water. Mm. So there is less less labor that needs to go per calorie when you're growing those three things together because they're doing some of the work for you. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So with that, there is... And that's a method already been proven and figured out by... Yeah, centuries ago. Yeah. Um, Most most indigenous communities say that their wisdom comes from time immemorial. So like Mm. before we started recording, this this was known to be effective. Right. Um, So... There is a layer to which that is more labor intensive because you can't put a heavy machine through and harvest individually Hmm. the corn, bean and um, squash that has to be done by hand. And so I, I don't think it's a matter of can we produce enough? I think it's a matter of revising our revising our priorities of how we're prioritizing labor. Um, because it's not the most profitable, hmm. but it is uh, a great way to get the calories, to get the nutrition, um, to maintain the soil we use to grow, and it can be sustaining. And so when when you need to be putting in money to your 401k and when you need to be um, saving up for the future and when you need to pay for child support and elder support, Um, And when your rent is exploitative in that system, it it doesn't make sense to ask someone to pay the price it would take to make that food that way. Hmm. So there needs to be a reordering of how all of those systems are working together. What what would it mean um, for someone to do more child care? Uh, without necessarily getting more money in this current system that is abusive. I'm not going to, I'm not trying to say that we should be getting free labor out of anyone, um, especially uh, because childcare labor has been um, used as a weapon of exploiting uh, and getting free labor out of women and um, like young children. Mm. Um, So how do we unwind and think about what, how to, how to orient childcare for the benefit of the community? Um, right now, it's sort of for the benefit of the workers who can afford it and for the benefit of the people who own the nurseries or daycare, daycares. Um, but how do we, what does it look like when childcare is reoriented for the benefit of the community? How does it look when we reorient growing food for the benefit of the community? Mm-hmm. Which looks different than if you're growing food for the benefit of uh, your profit margin. Because like I said, with the heavy machinery, you can't put a heavy machine in and harvest the three sisters. Right but that can deliver calories and nutrients to the community. So it's very valuable to the community, not very valuable to to capitalists. So it it requires a reorientation of why we are doing things, why we are making things. So the whole system is set up to not, yeah, it's a, the whole, I mean, the system is breaking down. I mean, we're seeing that in a lot of different ways. Yeah. I don't know if it was ever a sustainable system. And we're living on it and we've built so many layers on top of it that, and we're starting to see them shake. And that's, that's a lot of that credit. A lot of that criticism is like when people are calling it late stage capitalism, like that system can't hold up forever and we're seeing it shake. And so the, the things that like the contradictions around us, um, are most glaring because the system is breaking down. Yeah. Um, it's not delivering the middle class that it promised. Oh yeah. Um, so what, what, what is the deal? Why are we orienting our labor this way? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. I've talked to my dad a little bit about this. Um, not this spe- specific subject, but we talk about the system we're living in. And I think a life is a lot more like a garden more so than, uh, I see things in the garden in life patterns of it in life a lot. And one of the patterns you see in the garden is you take one seed and you plant it and then you get a lot more seeds typically. And, uh, in my, in where we work, we, we go and we work 
a certain amount of hours and we get this certain amount of money back. And it's not like I plant a seed and then it multiplies. Mm-hmm. There's no multiplication. It's a one to one, never growing. The labor is multiplying. You just don't get the benefit of that <laughs> multiplication. Yeah. It's shrinking. Yeah. It's, it's only, yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. And so it's like, that's not the way, that's not the natural progression of how things should be. That's, that's just the world around us. When you plant one thing, it grows into multiple things. Yeah. So really interesting to think about that stuff. So I guess you would say it's doable to mass produce on a sustainable scale if the system switched. Yeah. Probably not in our current system. No, and I think I think there is this I think there's this middle ground of people doing doing enough within the system to do the things the system demands and then spending the extra energy on this other thing. Yeah. So with the garden, for example, um, I didn't pay anyone. I asked people to help. We had a good time. Yeah. We learned from each other. We had company and you took vegetables. And so you you were getting things out of it. I was getting things out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was an example. Of, I was able to do that because I had a job that was paying my rent. I had enough extra cash to buy the lot. I, I was, I was living with the system enough that I could live. Right. Um, and, and so were you, and we were able to then do this other thing that's not within the system. Yeah. Um, and I think the more, the more folks do enough within the system and then try to do things outside I think we can start to make this bubble of the counter example of this example of what it looks like when we're not doing it that way. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. There's, there's uh it's going back to even just like local so Absolutely. much more local. Cause it's like, yeah, we're working inside the system, which, you know, could be, you know, you could be working for a company and that money's going out of the lo- local area. And then you come back to like spending time with people who live near you and producing something that only can be produced in your area. I mean, it can be produced other places, but you can't grow a lime tree or a mango tree easily in <laughs> Indiana. It's not going to fruit. It's not, it, maybe if you're a mad genius like you, maybe you could, but <laughs> the majority of people wouldn't be able to have, you know, you'd have to have an underground bunker with artificial, who knows what. But it's, yeah, so it's like um, it going back to that local, you know, spend time with people and eating food that's grown in your area that's from, the, you know, it's, it's just... Um, yeah, and I think that's how we were created, to be more of in a garden and local, to hang out with people. That's more of the system that should be set up. So, you hear Noah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, poor baby. I know. Thinking about, thinking about um, like, local market realities. So, um, that, that feels like, well, uh, stepping back from market and more being like, what is the commerce landscape of, mm-hmm. an, of an area? Um, and thinking about the commerce landscape is the same as like the soil in the garden where there are things that are naturally feeding other things within the soil. And then, um, when they fruit, we all benefit, like we all benefit from the fact that doctors want to live here. Hmm. There are places now that doctors don't want to live and they can't hire doctors. (laughs) Wow. Um, so thinking, thinking about, um, the productivity of all of us, which is is hard when we're talking about cities of thirty five thousand people, fifty thousand people, or and, and that's Goshen and Elkar are on the small side, um, but it's, it's hard LA. to think about um, the productivity of each person then being a thing that someone else in the community can receive, hmm. um, like the it's not just that Ben Hartman has set up just north of town and is selling great produce. But the people of Goshen can get such great produce because he's here doing that. Yeah. And because people buy this stuff, he can continue. Right. Um, and because people are going to the restaurants that buy his tomatoes, because people are paying overpriced pizza at Venturi, <laughs> uh, Ben Hartman's tomatoes are going to stay in business. Right. Which pizza's delicious. The tomatoes are delicious. Right. Um, Just but that two arms and two legs. To, all, yeah. all of these, yeah. all of these are are linked if if we weren't yep. if we weren't in if we weren't enjoying these pizza we would not have the production of tomatoes locally that right. we have right and if we did not have the production locally we would not have the quality of life that's enhanced by the once in a blue moon expensive pizza we <laughs> yeah. can get it is fun i love going uh once a year with it <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what it takes. Yeah, it, I like to take a snack before pregame. Yeah, yeah. So you don't buy any alcohol. <laughs> you're not 
you're not actually hungry by the time you get there. Yeah. <laughs> you have some breadsticks and you leave, right? Everybody, yeah. No, they, they, cool combination. It's a very cool little spot. But yeah, you're yeah. right. That is like the soil. I never even thought about that. That's such a good like, And all the, all the things are interacting. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and there's a couple doctors who live here because they love Venturi Pizza and the fact they can get that and local produce and stuff, you know, or or yeah. whoever. There's young people, there's cool people who want to live in this town because of those features. I mean, we were just talking to your friend today, and, and she, he was like, "I love." Uh, I didn't realize how much I love Goshen. I, I, Goshen's cool because I, I, I just didn't realize how cool it was, and then I got here and it's cool, you know. And it's like, yeah, that is a very sweet thing that someone from the outside is seeing that. And, I mean, we live in it, but then mm-hmm. when you come from some place and you t- you taste it, you're like, oh, this, there's something a little different here, and I like it. Um, yeah. Uh, good. Tell me a little bit about how you got to Goshen. Yeah. So I grew up kind of bouncing around Illinois, Indiana, Michigan. Um, I spent elementary and middle school in Goshen. I thought it was a really cool place. Uh, wrapped up high school in Illinois and then came back to Goshen for college. Um, I studied peace and justice and my senior internship was at the center for community justice. They do victim offender mediation in Elkhart County. Hmm. So I, um, my senior internship turned into my first job. And so I worked in Elkhart for most of my career. And then, um, I just lived in Goshen for that whole time. Yeah. Cause you, I mean, you went to Goshen college and so Mm -hmm. what does that look like that, that job, the intermediator yeah so being doing victim offender mediation is um interesting it takes skills it takes a lot of energy Hmm. um so the way that it works at ccj center for community justice you get a case so you get um a document from the court about uh what has happened so far um and you can look at the um, the sentencing. And so the sentencing will go over like, are they sentenced to probation? Are they sentenced to serve time? How's that all break down? Are they sentenced to restitution? And so usually the, the mediation would enter the case through the restitution. So restitution is the word for, um, any out of pocket expenses incurred as a result of a crime. So that is different than like pain and suffering, or if you were going to sue someone for like, any any personal reason you want to say right um so then with with restitution being determined through victim offender mediation um uh you get the case you get the contact information for the victim for the offender and so you reach out to each party and basically say um hey what what's up what's going on uh What was this crime? How are you affected? Are you interested in this process? Hmm. Um, And so then if they're interested or at least want to learn more, then the next step is that they come in, you do an intake, you speak with them, and you figure out a few Is this the victim or the perpetrator or both? So both. Okay. Um, So you're you're figuring out what happened sort of narratively Mm -hmm. um, because the crime burglary forced entry to attempt a felony right that does not tell you what happened right like it doesn't say what was taken and also doesn't say how that affected the person right um or if there's history there or if it's a totally random there's probably a lot more a lot more outside of that that yeah can't get from just a so in in asking the uh each party like what happened you get that in narrative form um and so that's that's important for a few reasons one because um identity trauma healing all happen in narrative um it's not that x event happened it's that x event happened and you remember it in y way and Mm. you um make meaning about it in z way so like all of these steps uh of like perception and making meaning happen from like the event that materially happened to how it affects you Hmm. Uh, so in narrative, you're, you're able to talk about those things and then you're also able to like ask, is there anything that you want to say or ask the other person or say to the other person or ask the other person? Um, we're able to, after hearing the narrative, be able to be like, okay, so like what was taken, what was damaged? 
And those are the, the questions that get us to understanding what, um, what the appropriate amount for restitution is. Hmm. And so with the offender, it's, it's pretty similar starting with narrative, like what, what happened? Um, then going into, um, what, what sorts of things are you willing to do to make things right? Hmm. Um, and so asking that open-ended cause some people want to like want to pay for everything that was stolen and want to like mow their yard for a year and want to like yeah. bake them a cake. Right. Um, so some people probably don't want anything to do with it either too. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it really is a whole mix. Um, and so like the openness of the process is, uh, really unique in the way that allows all of the people involved to be people. Hmm. Um, because in court, uh, the, the decisions that get made, get made by the judge weighing the arguments of the offenders, smart person making an argument versus mm-hmm. the victim, smart person making an argument. Yeah. Um, and here each person is showing up as themselves, representing themselves mm-hmm. and saying, this is how it affected me. This is what I need to move forward. Hmm. Um, wow. and saying, uh, and, and that, that goes for both parties. There is like closure for both. Yeah. 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 The possibility of closure, which that possibility doesn't exist in the criminal justice system. Hmm. Um, and I don't want to say that we, we guarantee or deliver closure, but it's, it is possible in our system and it's not possible in that system. Wow. If they do restitution, does that affect their, um, the offenders time or anything like that no. or no. Okay. So it's more of just like a, um, like a emotional, physical healing thing that happens. Yeah. There, there are places where those are connected. Um, here in Elkhart County, we try to keep them separate just so that no one fakes it to reduce right. their time. Right. Right. It's authentic. Yeah. Yeah. And you, there's you know, there's nothing on the line that you do this because you feel it. Yeah. There's something to that way more than like, oh, yeah, I can shave off five years if I do this. Just go through the motions. No, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, just. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Did you see a lot of interesting cases? From that? Um, Probably a lot of like. I wouldn't say so. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like they they all sort of end up blending together. Yeah. Um, I mean, most victims. The story is this thing got destroyed or taken or burned or I was harassed and I want to know why me. Mm. And also, as I'm telling you the story, I'm describing how I was re-victimized by the police. Mm. So the things that I heard from almost every victim was the question of why me and telling me that the police re-victimized them as victims who were trying to report the crime. Wow. Um, That's frustrating. Which is, Yeah frustrating and heartbreaking and infuriating. Um, and it was always, it was always a relief to watch the, the victims feel the relief to know that they weren't picked. Hmm. They, there wasn't actually any reason yeah, that it happened to them. They're like, Oh, I've, I'm going to just do this right now here more. Yeah. Probably. Which I don't know if that's comforting or scary that these crimes, <laughs> yeah. like people weren't, these victims targeted. weren't picked. No yeah. one was targeted. Yeah. Um, and so like when you feel, or when, when, when you have like a burglary, like you feel like it is about you. Yeah. And it, again, there's, there's sort of this detached abstract. There's a lot of detached abstract concepts that go into mediating, and one of them is like, the crime's not about the victim. Right. Which is in contrast with the fact that we are centering victims' needs. The This process is about the victim. But at the same time, we acknowledge that the crime likely wasn't about the victim. Hmm. So that's that's sort of one of these things that we hold. It's like a little juggling act, kind of. Yeah. Trying to figure out how to make them feel, but then also like explain to them what's going on. Wow. Right. And oh. that's not something that I would say. That's something that would come out in the meeting. So yeah. uh, I was going through the process and then we got sidetracked. So the process yeah. is we have that meeting where uh, that's just me and one of the parties mm-hmm. sort of going over the narrative, what they want to say or ask, going over what restitution is possible or that they're requesting. 
Um, and then we have a meeting together mm. where we start off with instruct introductions and saying ground rules about what the expectations are for this conversation. So we're not just like throwing people in a room saying, mm -hmm. talk it out. Go, yeah, go at it. Yeah. Um, but sort of describing our role as our role is to make sure that this conversation happens well. Mm. And then um, each party speaks uh, about like their narrative of what happened. Um if if one of the parties had a radically different story about what happened in such a way that it seemed like these things can't both be true, um, we would probably work that out ahead of time. Hmm. Um, usually by the time we get to mediation, what both people are saying is true from their point of view. Yeah, Even if it looks different, yeah. uh, it's, it's the same if you squint. Right, right. So that and then talking about how people were affected. And so this, this is both the victim and the offender about how they were affected by the crime. And then going into the needs of the victim that were created by the crime and then how the offender can address those needs. Mm. And so that, um, and then, and then there's of course, closing it up, wrapping up any loose ends in the conversation. And then, um, knowing that things will get followed up with. Mm. Um, but there's in, in saying this is what happened, this is how it affected me, this is what I need. Um, that's a really different conversation than what happens in court, which is this is the statute they were charged under, this is the evidence we have that this statute was violated, mm -hmm. and this is what my client deserves. Hmm. That is, th those are super different questions. Yeah, those are. And in one of them, we're we're working with humans. Right. With in in the legal system, we're working with ideas. Right. Um, the idea of like this statute that was written down by someone who's like now dad right. versus like, this is what happened to me. Yeah, I am true. here and now. And that has resulted in me having needs here and now. Right. Right. Wow. How long did you do that for? I did that for about two and a half years. Wow. Yeah. I could see how that'd be emotionally draining. I mean, you, a lot of work to, to pull the, that off in one. Yeah. Yeah. And so a lot of people who, who go into this work are highly empathetic. And so, there's sort of this, um, they call it like empathy fatigue, mm -hmm. but to it happens with social work yeah. too. I know that's what I've heard. Yeah. So like having, having empathy for the people you're working with who are really going through it mm. while also remembering not to get emotionally invested in it while also recognizing that there are elements of this crime that are intersecting with things that you are emotionally invested in. Mm. Um, I had, I had one case where, um, a person just threw all their partner stuff outside and like burned it. Oh my. Um, and there's a layer to which I was like, this is like, this is terrorism. Like this is, uh, a person of one gender, like, terrorizing a person of another gender. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the, the side of me that cares about, um, gender equality and cares about, uh, not being terrorized for who you are, or who you love, yeah. like, like flared up. Right. And so figuring out how do I address this case and how do I continue without being invested, right? but still caring and still having empathy. Oh, what a, what eggshell to walk around. You Absolutely. Just yeah. Tiptoeing through the tulips trying to figure out how to do this. That's yeah. crazy. How'd you do it? You just, you figured it out. You figured out maybe what, why you were feeling this way and then how to relate to this person. I mean, there's some of that. Um, that's the growing, the yeah. doing it and understanding and, oh, wow. you know, I, I don't, I don't know that I developed necessarily any mantras about that one. Hmm. Um, some, some victims or offenders that you work with are, uh, very angry, angry that this happened to them, angry about every part of the system, um, angry at the police, angry at the, the prosecuting attorney, angry at the judge, angry at like the system. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when you call them, they just like, they want to yell at you. They want to make they they're they're venting they're yeah mm -hmm. they're lashing out i'm sure i'm sure they would describe it as venting but like they're lashing out and so recognizing like 
these things are real frustrations and these things are not fun to hear. And yeah. these things are being said in a tone that I should not be spoken to. Right. And still figuring out what does it mean to like validate this victim in this instance and believe that that does not justify me being spoken to in that way. Yeah. And <laughs> I will, I will be fine if I'm spoken to this way for this call and I can, I can decompress afterwards. Wow. Um, like all of that together is, is a lot. And so that is, that is one, um, that like took a lot of growth into, um, and I had a supervisor who helped me through it really well. Uh, she could sort of tell when I might be avoiding a call because it wasn't going to be fun. Right. And she would be like, okay, awesome. AJ, AJ is awesome. You're doing great. <laughs> You're about to be so great in this call uh, and it might be uncomfortable. And then afterwards, awesome. AJ will still be here. <laughs> That's uh, sweet. <laughs> yes. That's cool. I, I, one of my best supervisors. Yeah. Um, truly. Uh, but having that attitude of like, this isn't going to be fun. I'm going to feel personally attacked. I'm going to be treated in ways that I do not deserve to be treated. And I'm not justifying that. And I recognize it's temporary and it is in service of a bigger goal I have. And I will be able to survive it afterwards. Hmm. Um, is, is hard. That's that Mac, the macro picture Yeah. of it. The, Oh Yeah. The fact that we have fresh tomatoes means we can have good doctors. That's the <laughs> macro picture. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's yep. really cool to, to hear. That's tough. Not And when you're in it, it's not fun to. It absolutely is not. Yeah. It's a, I've been in those. Done calls. Not the same, but for sure. Like, I know this person's going to yell at me when I call them. I'm not looking forward to talking to you. I don't want to talk to you. I'm going to try to avoid this. And that makes it worse sometimes, too. You know? So it depends yep. on the situation. Yeah. That's. Now. You did not not the same thing, but something similar for Goshen. Like this kind of rolled into Goshen, working for Goshen, right? Yeah. In a way. So timeline wise, I started at CCJ, um, Center for Community Justice, doing victim offender mediation. Then I jumped on at the food pantry at Church Community Services. Okay, that's where you did gardening. Yep, that's mm -hmm. where I started gardening. That's where I did all that self learning. Yeah, um, and I love that idea. I'm just gonna say this real quick: the 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 food pantry gardening aspect. That's such a cool thing. I think that's such a cool thing. It truly was a special program and a special organization. Yeah, that's awesome. So then I, um, from there, I bounced back to um, more towards the structure change, social change aspect with mm -hmm. the city of Goshen. So my title there was um, community relations director. I was the head of the CRC, the Community Relations Commission. Their mission, very briefly put, um, is to create a Goshen free of discrimination of any kind. Hmm. So my... <laughs> That's a very daunting task right there. It is. Like, it is. Man, how do you do that? Yeah. But anyways, go yeah, ahead. Yeah. So I brought a lot of my restorative justice background into it. So um, in restorative justice, I so I spoke a bit about the process for victim offender mediation. Mm -hmm. Restorative justice is a huge field of knowledge and practice. And I just want to take the moment to zoom out and say a lot of things that are restorative justice and a lot of things that inform restorative practices and a lot of the practices are indigenous to the Americas and Africa. Hmm. Um, these are indigenous practices. These are, these are indigenous ideals. Um, so you see certainly, them. certainly in their, certainly in their origin, that's not to say that there haven't been Western influences on um, the practices that are happening now or that mm. there's not Western influences on whatever, but there, there is the sort root of element is there. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay. Um, and Very so cool. a lot of, there's a lot of justice stuff that can be restorative justice. And so one of them is thinking about um, what does this look like in schools? So with victim offender mediation, there's the obligations of the offender, there's the needs of the victim, and there's sort of the idea of um, all the stakeholders being as active as possible. Mm -hmm. Occasionally you have someone who doesn't want to show up and be a good person. Right. <laughs> um, so that's the as possible part. If somebody doesn't want to show up and do their part, 
um, you just, you don't have them. You don't force someone who's going to be shitty into the conversation. Right. So that's what it looks like in the crime context. In schools, there's three different pillars. The three pillars are that humans are relational and worthy of relationship. Mm. There is creating just and equitable learning conditions and there's repairing harm when it happens. Mm. So the repairing harm is going to use those principles from, um, the victim offender system because that's about addressing harm. Right. Um, but acknowledging the humanity of people and that humans need to be in relationship and validating that we want to cultivate that relationship. The right order for a classroom is to be ordered in relationship where the students know that their teacher cares about them in a non creepy way. Right. (laughs) Um, and that the, the students can trust each other enough, um, as students. Yeah. Kids be whack sometimes. Yeah. But like, trust someone as much as you should trust an eight eight year old, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and then the, the other side, what did I say? Repairing harm when it happens, Uh, 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 just in equitable learning conditions. So that's things like, um, it has now become the hot button topic of social emotional learning. Social emotional learning is just, um, talking about the things, uh, that help you identify and regulate your emotions, help you show up to social interactions in a way that's going to be helpful. Um, which is necessary if you're on any team, which every job I've had, I've been in a department. Right. <laughs> so that's necessary. Um, right. Well, in the relational aspect, I mean, we're all, you're working with humans. Absolutely. You, that's a major, major aspect of life is a relational. I mean, we talked about that at the garden. Yeah. Like there's something to do that. You need to be able to relate. But anyways. Keep going. And uh, the, the just and equitable part includes also knowing that... Um, Making, making places where everyone can have the same outcomes. Um, if we have all of these books and all of them have um, paper-colored children in them, I'm not going to see myself in them. Uh, if we have a few books uh, where there are brown children and the brown children all live on like the gross side of town in the books mm. suspiciously, I'm going to see my place <laughs> as... <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I'm going to see my place as being in the gross side of town. Mm-hmm. So having having classroom materials that reflect that everyone can have potential. There's a place for everyone. And that's um that's often what like about racially like that's where the racial equity piece comes in. So social um making sure that learning environments are um just and equitable means that it's fair for everyone to learn here and that everyone really can engage fully. Yeah. I, I, I think about Goshen and uh, I think one of the stats I heard is 56% of Goshen high school is Hispanic. Mm-hmm. So I wonder like even in just a practical way is like, you know, how many resources do we have that are in Spanish? You know, I think that's a great question. And not, that's one of the things you're not that in that it. role anymore. You don't have to worry. You don't have to answer, but I'm just, yeah. I was like, Oh, that's I, cause you don't think about it. But I'm like, if you're going into a learning environment you have nothing that even relates to what you're trying to learn. Like, how are you going to learn? That that's it's difficult, especially when who knows when you came. Maybe you came when you're two, or maybe you came when you're eight, or you're born here, or you're born here. It could be, you know. And it's like that. And then your parents. I just, it's like, how do you learn? And then you're thrown into the system that's like everything English. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as a matter of fact, the high school has tried to do that kind of things of including of including more materials, including more inclusive materials, and um they've been attacked for it. Mm. Um which is which is really sad. So, thinking about those three pillars, um those three pillars are really about having a strong, robust community that can respond to harm. Mm. So, those were the three pillars that I thought about um when making when thinking about what does it mean? to action towards a city without discrimination. So um, just an equitable learning environment, just an equitable place to live, work, and learn. So if you're working here, if you're living here, if you're learning here, you're a student, or even you're like just driving in for um, the college or mm-hmm. driving in for English classes or driving in for Spanish classes, what does it mean to for this to be a just and equitable place for you to do that? Or an, just an equitable place for everyone to believe that they can meet they can find their highest earning potential, hmm. whatever that potential is that they can find that their that race isn't going to be a barrier to them being the most productive resident they can be. Hmm. And that race isn't going to be an, a barrier to being able to live in the part of town that you would like to, that you can afford to. Right. Um, right. So there's, there's that angle then acknowledging that uh, everyone is relational and worthy. So building bridges between the communities in Goshen, 
Goshen has like six or seven different communities that don't really mix. Right. Um, How can we, how can we try to cultivate relationships between those communities so that we have, um, so that we have a better idea of what's going on. One of the biggest limitations, if we have people that, if there are a number of experiences in the city that we have no idea the details of, I don't, I don't really know what it's like for an Amish person to live in the city. Right. So like, as I'm thinking about what are the problems in my neighborhood, what are, what kinds of solutions should we be looking for? What kinds of development do I want? Everything that I think of is going to be excluding the experiences of one of those circles. And so there's also like Hispanic oh. people. There's also conservative people. There's also um, yeah. all, all of the circles that I don't Ukrainians, interact with. You got big Ukrainian. Ukrainians. Yeah. Um, there's, I mean, the Hispanic. Yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch of mixes of in- individuals here. So if I don't have any relationships with anybody in those circles... When I think about what it means to live here, I'm going to be wrong. When I think about what problems we have, I'm going to be wrong. When I think about what the solution should look like, I'm going to be wrong. Hmm. Because I am missing so many experiences of yeah. Goshen. Um, yeah. And so that's, that's. I mean, I think that there's value in the relationships for their own sake. Um, but there, I think the other side also matters, what I was saying about um, just making sure we have an accurate understanding of the place we live. Yeah. Um, and then the, know the last your part, audience. Yeah. That's last, a big thing. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Last part of making, um, of being able to repair harm when it happens. Hmm. Our community is going to have things that happen that break community. Neighbors are going to fight. People are going to do worse than just neighbors fighting. Right. Um, so is there a way that we can talk about it, that we can address it, that we can address the harm? Or at least make sure everyone hears each other to make a plan where people can go forward. Right. Um, so that so that our, our community can just function better. Yeah. Um, when things go un, unsaid and unresolved, like that's not good for anyone. Right. Well, if something does happen, I mean, you talked about when the victim can talk about it in their narrative or the perpetrator can talk about it in their narrative, that starts the healing process. Yeah. So if we're not even talking about it, sometimes I know stuff that happens that doesn't go onto the news or gets kind of slid, in, slid under the rug. Like I can't find it. There was a drive-by shooting that happened a couple of years ago on the street. And it's like, there was nothing about that. And it was kind of hidden. And it's like, that happened in our neighborhood and everyone's feeling the tension from that a bit. Mm-hmm. And we need to kind of talk about that or at least like, hey, there's an issue here. How... I wasn't a victim, but I was a part of it. It was in my neighborhood. I'm feeling the ripple effect. Yeah. And so I think there is some some very important things to that. I think that's good to to at least focus on that. Like, hey, we need to be talking about this. And and when we like I said, restorative justice is this whole breadth of ideas and practices. Yeah. Um when we look at things, there's there's primary mm-hmm. victims, there's people who got shot. There's secondary victims, there's the significant others, there's mm-hmm. the parents, there's the children of the people who got shot. Mm-hmm. And then there's the tertiary victims of I I know this happened so close to me and this happening shook my sense of safety Mm -hmm. and so I was not shot but I also like am now on alert and like I'm moving quickly from my car to my house I'm don't know if I can trust my neighbors every time I hear firecrackers I don't think it's firecrackers anymore you know like that sense is gone it's like okay well are those gunshots well I guess it's fourth of July so could be either, <laughs> yeah. you know, but yeah, it's yeah. so people, people, um, might say, well, you're not a victim because what would we, what would you expect anyone to do for you? Mm. And that is very much thinking about, um, victims and offenders and right and wrong and becoming a victim as violating a statute of like this thing ha- wrong happened to you. Somebody else should suffer X. Mm when we switch it to say the narrative of you saying what happened, how you heard about it, how you were frustrated that it wasn't picked up um, and saying how it then moving from what happened from your perspective to how it impacted you to what you need, what you need could be just a reassurance from the cops to say like, Hey, we are doing our best. We are monitoring certain groups in the community. We, um, we do believe the threat is now gone um, and we're going to stay vigilant. That that seems reasonable Mm -hmm. where like if somebody's like you're not a victim what do you expect like what do you expect to get like if we say like something proportionate like 
you're not you're not asking for the moon. You're asking for something that feels reasonable. And when you use the restorative justice lens, people end up with reasonable conclusions. They yeah. ask for the things that meet what they need. Mm. And I yeah. think that that's I think that's fine when people say they need something to heal. Like, yeah. well, at least trust listen. them. Yeah. Listen to them. It's yeah. not going to hurt you to listen. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. Um, I, I really um, appreciated that Juneteenth article you wrote in that. I remember reading that. And there's things I had never even realized uh, when you sent that flyer out to all of Goshen. I was like, this is fascinating. To um, I think it was started by, a, was it a church or some, there was some religious aspect to it that I not even, yeah. was even, even aware of, you know, and I think Juneteenth is, um, in one in one world it's a talking point and in another it's 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 a holiday and both those things but to understand the background of it was very helpful i'm like oh this is a more complex nuanced perspective on something and i like that i really appreciated that uh that you wrote that and i know you were doing things like that and i know there was the, even the community meetings mm-hmm. that um you're running as well where people are coming together and talking pre-COVID and <laughs> COVID kind of yeah. threw a wrench into that stuff. And then all of the different uh, parties and stuff that you would throw or events mm-hmm. throughout the city. And so that was really solid. Uh, probably needed even now more so than ever, but absolutely. I don't know who's, I was honored and proud to put on the city's first Juneteenth event. Um, that, that, that is going to live in my heart forever. Yeah. Um, also, the things that I took into that that job in communicating with the public, I wanted to make sure that um, what I wrote could be meaningful to anyone. Mm-hmm. Um, so really starting at ground zero, because if I if I want to move the needle towards X, I want to make sure that everyone knows what I'm saying. I believe what I'm asking for isn't isn't ridiculous. I don't I believe it's not extreme. I don't I don't think it's out of left field. So. Um, to just sort of start with the basics of Juneteenth is a celebration of the end of slavery. The way that it's been celebrated historically, I mean, has been tied with the idea of Jubilee. And so that's that church connection you were mm-hmm. mentioning of, um, I mean, Southern black folks who were deeply religious, also recently freed, celebrating and celebrating in the context of Jubilee as described as being the end of debt as the end of slavery. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that sort of evolving into being the celebration, but also this time to plan continued growth. Uh, These people have been, have been making magic happen and not reaping the rewards of their own talents. And so thinking about how can we, how can we do that again for ourselves? Mm-hmm. We we don't have land. We don't have tools. We don't have money. We're we're without capital. How do we make a way for ourselves? And I mean that's that's in planning. That's in not if you if you lose your hope, you're done. So right. we have to celebrate. We have to remember that good things do happen. Yeah. We have to get together and we have to talk to each other about what we need and what we can do and what we want to do. Um, and so there's there's all these layers of um, the economic, the political, the personal, the cultural, the social, all working together and Juneteenth being kind of all of them. Hmm. And I could get up and wax poetic about like what this means metaphysically in the social psyche, what this means for, what this means for black people celebrating and how maybe that is uh, premature given uh, the, the political realities but that I'm going to start losing people. Yeah. So like, let's start with what is the history? What are the things that can't be argued with? Because like you could double check them and I would be right. Yeah. (laughs) Um, so starting there and then, um, doing it in the context of a celebration. So Juneteenth is political and economic, but having an event where we are inviting people to celebrate with us, Mm -hmm. celebrate with us and see black joy. One of the things um, that came out of later 2020 was after, so Black Lives Matter became a slogan around 2013, 2014, um, was like the main slogan of um, the 2020 uprisings. And then towards the end of 20 or towards in later 2020, we got, we start to see variations of like not just black lives matter, but black hope matters, Hmm. black education matters, black joy matters. And that is so powerful because it's not just that black people deserve to live, but black people deserve 
to experience joy. Black people deserve to have um, to chase their hopes. They deserve to reach the economic aptitude or they deserve to reach the economic achievement that they have the aptitude for without being barred out for their race or lack of money or lack of generational money hmm. or generational education. Um, so uh, inviting people to celebrate with us, celebrate with us, learn with us. And also we're going to highlight our black neighbors that are, are making things in our community. Who are the black artists making things in our community? Mm -hmm. Because more houses in Goshen are beautiful on the inside because we have neighbor or because we have artists who are our neighbors. Mm -hmm. We have um, all, all of the services provided by black people are those that are then services people in our community can receive. Right. Um, so black people are not just, um, not just uh, tolerated um, or included in our community, but recognizing these are people who are, contributing in valuable ways and we want to affirm that contribution yeah and yeah, it's a, it's a, like a spotlight you yeah know? it's like free marketing in a way too like that's so cool well i like what you said when we first started talking about this is goshen's made up of six or seven different groups yeah and so you wrote that article to hit those six or seven different groups you did a really good job of thinking of a way to um uh communicate a message effectively to those groups instead of to one group who would really love that message that, you know, I, I think you did a great job. Of. Yeah. I mean, if I wanted to get everyone from the Goshen college bubble, right. over, I, I could have, right. But yeah. that, what does that mean for the community? And, and my, my job was really about the whole community, making it the whole community, mm -hmm. um, less discriminating, the whole community, more just and equitable, the whole community closer tied to each other. Um, so yeah, bringing it, bringing it to a level where anyone can feel invited. Yeah. I love how much you appreciate our community. That's such a cool thing. You really are. I see you like, um, I see the, the our community as hard dirt and you're over there <laughs> working it like <laughs> just oh, boy. working in and just trying to, to loosen it up a bit. And I really appreciate that because, um, this is a community worth putting work and effort into, I feel like. It truly is. So I, I love that. God, talk a little bit about what you're doing now in LA. Yeah. I would love to hear a little bit of that. And do you want a spindrift? I'm about to pop up another. Um, what you got in there? The spindrifts. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, you want to? Yeah, that one looks cool. Okay. Blood orange. That's good stuff. All right. I have some LaCroix too. Nah. Yeah. I don't want a LaCroix. A pop that thought about a grape once <laughs> yeah no, thank you uh so what i'm doing right now um i like to briefly summarize as i garden with homeless youth okay so my title is community garden youth liaison i am working with uh, an organization called safe place for youth they are um, an organization working in venice which is a neighborhood of los angeles they are serving homeless youth most of their um, members are between 16 and 24 years old. Mm. So they, I'm really excited by how multifaceted the organization is. There are programs, there's housing, there's case management. So they're, they really are trying to address things from all angles. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite quotes, holistic, holistic. Yes. I like that. One of my favorite quotes is for every complicated multifaceted problem, there is a simple, elegant solution that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I think there's, there's truth in making sure that we are trying to address all the angles at once. Yeah. And so one of the angles is education and employment. And so this is the employment aspect. So we're able to hire interns and, um, there's some education and head stuff about learning, learning about soil, learning about, uh, uh, food practices from the past, from the present, mm -hmm. um, and, also learning the like doing doing work in the dirt uh we're we're in we're in the city we've got in ground beds um that are basically the landscaping of two nonprofits has been converted oh that's cool um, yeah and so we we garden there oh. so we're gardening in the middle of the city um, and we're able to do a little bit of education. We're able to do some mentorship. This counts as um, job credit, and they're also getting paid. Hmm. Wow. 
Okay, you're giving them all of the different things there. Just in that aspect, and I'm sure there's other programs that then help them. Yeah, so that's um, just like when they're here. A, a part of being in the internship means that they're also engaging with the other things in the employment department, which involve um, coaching on how to interview, mm -hmm. um, resume building, and editing. Yep. So there's there's really all of that. Wow. And these these youths are just living on the street. Maybe not all of them, but so homelessness. Yeah. Wild term. I just want to break that down. Say, yeah. <laughs> I just want to start talking all the things I know about homelessness. So homelessness numbers in the u.s are fakely low okay so globally homelessness is usually defined as you do not own a house mm -hmm. and your name is not on a lease okay in the u.s we so so people who would not be homeless in the u.s but would be homeless other places like in europe right um people who are couch surfing would be homeless in europe okay um Living if, in a camper maybe or something like that or uh, Just, would they be homeless? Like if they're in a caravan, which would be like an RV, yeah. would they be homeless in Europe, you think? Or no? Yeah. So really in the U.S., it's it's only only urban campers are homeless. So yeah. if you're not in a tent, you're housed. So if you oh, are wow. sleeping with someone and the day you stop putting out is the day you're on the street. In other places in the world, you would be homeless. In the U.S., you're not homeless until the day you stop putting out. Wow. Um, If you are... Like, so survival sex, we said couch surfing. Um, if you're precariously housed, if you, uh, your name's not on the lease, but everyone whose name is on the lease is cool with it. Uh, you don't really have a right to be there. They could kick right. you out and throw all your stuff out and you would not be able like to that. sue. You would right. have, you would have no recourse. You'd have no protection. Right. Um, so the, or if you're living in your car, hmm. um, a lot of. I don't, I don't want to say a lot. There are youth who are living in their vehicles, which is not safe for one. Yeah. Um, but two in this complicated space of they're not on the street, but they're also not in long-term housing that they have a right to be in. Yeah. Not a sustainable place. Right. Car's going to break down at some point. Yours broke down three times. On the <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Yeah. So it's like, it's yeah. I, it, that thing is only temporary. For so long. Right. Yeah. So there's Not the term that we like to use um, more precisely is precariously housed. People who do not have a right to long term housing. Hmm. They so basically if you do if you don't own and you don't have your name on the lease, you're precariously housed. Whatever your situation is, it ain't forever. Right. Um uh homeless. So nomenclature around social issues change and there's always friction there. So um, the term unhoused, this is one that I did not really get um, for a long time. I recently uh, learned a little bit more about why unhoused is becoming a term. Mm -hmm. um, but homeless makes sense when we're talking about uh, like a domicile, like you don't, you don't have a building to live in. Mm -hmm. Um, but home can also mean the people who love you, the the community that loves you. And so when we're talking about people who live in Venice and then get evicted because their landlord wants to renovate, and when that happens, they can't afford to live anywhere else, they don't have a building to live in. And at the same time, Venice is their home. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't want to use language that's taking that away from them. Like this, this is your home. This is where you lived until someone decided to evict you. Right. Um, and so there's, there's value in recognizing that homes are more than just the buildings. And, um, for right now, the term that sort of getting popularized is unhoused. Um, and so I think the organization often pairs the two that we're serving people who are precariously housed and unhoused hmm. um, because some of our youth are in short term emergency housing or they're doing survival sex or um, they're couch surfing, wow. but they don't have their name on a long term lease. Yeah. Yeah. And they're 16 or they're 17 or 18. I mean, yeah. That's, mm -hmm. And those are hard 
it's hard to you have to have capital to be able to put your name down on a lease. Yeah, first I mean, and last and security deposit. I mean, I mean my my rent, the rent for my apartment is like twenty four fifty. Wow. So asking oh asking a youth for a one month security department or uh, deposit? Bleh, de- yeah. security deposit on top of having to pay first month at the top of the month. Yeah. That's six grand or more. Yeah. Right there. And this is one of the cheapest apartments in the city. Oh my word. Um I I was looking for for a one bed or studio for thirteen hundred and I could not find one. Wow. Um which is just, again, this is absurd. And it's a complex, multifaceted problem. Mm-hmm. Um, on one angle, there is, uh, so I was talking about orienting why we're doing things, why we're making things. So before it was with food, now talking about housing. Why are we making housing? Is it so the community can be housed or is it to maximize profits? And That's the latter. <laughs> right. And so there's, there's... The thing that has gotten under my skin and the thing that has been so unavoidable, like right in my face, I would have to try hard not to look at it, is the line between how much a landlord could charge and have break even and then have like 20% profit. That line is nowhere near where prices are. Mm. Prices are way higher. And so that's like the margin that you would expect for like a retailer. Yeah. You would you would want twenty percent at least. If you're yeah. a bigger retailer, probably you're you're buying wholesale at fifty percent the MSRP. Right. So right. that's not. This isn't like other markets. Also, unlike other markets, <laughs> markers, I can like if I really have to, I can figure out how to make my sign with pens. Right. Or if I really want to do something artistic, I could figure out how to make my sign with paint. I can't not buy housing like i have to pay for housing right i am a person i have to pay for housing or else i'm on the street and that's illegal now uh, oh, well really? it has been for a long time but that is illegal so the choice between um the choices between paying these astronomical rents or breaking the law so that's not a real choice <laughs> yeah, um that's not fair at all in in economic terms that's called inelastic demand so like uh Pomegranates are delicious. I Mm -hmm. like pomegranates. If pomegranates are cheaper, I'm going to buy more of them. If they're more expensive, I probably still buy like one a year. Right. Um, But there's, there's a point to which it could be so expensive. I won't buy the pomegranate. Right. Like I, I can, I can just not buy the pomegranate. Right. I can't just not buy housing. Right. And so it, um, people will talk about like market value, and terms like market value are assuming that the market is working in ordinary circumstances in places where the demand is not elastic, where people aren't going to buy more housing if it's cheaper. Um, the, the market price is not set by like the for- magical force of the invisible hand. It's set by greed of the people who own the properties. Yeah, just jacking it up. Yeah. And jacking it up. Yeah. That is uh, you could get a mansion out here for twenty four hundred. It feels like a month. You know, it's that's the hard part. But then, could you find a job that would support that? That's the other question. I'm making less than I did in Goshen. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, uh, that's frustrating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see how that almost perpetuates the unhoused uh, problem. You know, if yeah. there's people are unhoused, then it's like. It's so hard to get into a house. Like it just is only. It is. I I recently saw a statistic that was something like um, every week, 150 people leave being homeless or being unhoused to enter long term housing in Los Angeles County. And in that same same time frame, like 280 people have become homeless. Yeah. So it's. So people are people are finding long term housing. They people are leaving homelessness and more people are entering it. Yeah. Almost double. Yeah, that's wild. Dude, you got your work cut out there then, man. I'm glad you're out there and helping out with with those individuals and doing gardening and just trying to do my part. Yeah, that's cool. I know um kind of want to wrap this up cuz I got some other stuff, but I want to hear about your three oracles. Oh my goodness, the oracles. <laughs> I did not oracles. forget about this. I'd like to kind of hear if we could finish with this, that would be that would yeah. be sick. So uh, living in Los Angeles is a is a wild experience. 
Um, and it has spurred me to figure out new ways to cope. Hmm. Uh, so like one of the wild things is driving. Driving is so frustrating. Um, and one of the other things, so we're thinking about the, the cycle of people coming into, uh, coming into housing and people who are becoming unhoused. Mm -hmm. Um, in that cycle, it's, uh, when we talk about things like, uh, drug misuse disorder and mental health problems, it's not that. Um, those people are more likely to be among the 280 that are becoming homeless is that they're less likely to be a part of the 150 that are entering. Oh, uh, okay. So that just sort of concentrates there. So there, there are people who mumble or shout to themselves, um, on the street. And so figuring out how to, how to cope with that, which, uh, I do, I do want to like acknowledge the gravity of like, I'm sure this is a distressing experience for the other person. I, I don't want to center myself in their uh, mental health yeah. episode. But in Goshen, that's not happening often. Yeah. And so then you go into an environment where it's probably happening way more than it is. It's a little, it's a new uh, mix to the shake that you're and living in. <laughs> and it's it's a little disorienting and confusing and stressful to see because I'm not sure am I in danger? Are they, yeah. are they sort of having their episode and they're keeping it to themselves? Are they having their episode and they're going to push me in front of a train? What, where right. are we at? Right. Um, and so one of, one Oh, of it the throws things, a whole unknown dice into the mix. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the ways that I, um, started to cope or make meaning out of people saying things that don't make any sense um, is just sort of thinking about them as oracles, thinking oh, about them okay. um, as sort of these truth tellers that are telling some truth that is so transcendent. I don't have the context to understand what they're saying. <laughs> okay. um, one of these examples, I was waiting for the train um, and somebody sort of like walked by. and was like, do you hear that? Silence. I, like, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> but like also he's right. Like, do, do you hear the silence? Yeah, right now. <laughs> What is there to hear in the silence? Yeah, that's a really what, interesting... What truth is there? Do you hear that? Silence. Wow, um, okay. Another one. Uh, I was at a, uh, a transitional housing site um, where people were trying to get people off the street, and then once they're there, take a deep breath. We got you. You're not on the street. Right. Let's figure out what does it look like for you to um, find long-term housing. Yeah. Um, and so I was working in a raised bed, and somebody, the lawn chair oracle, I call her, uh, she sits in a long chair near the garden, uh, and she was just spouting some things about people of light and people of darkness. And I was like, oh, OK, sure. Um, and I think that there's the the hard part about it was what she was saying. I think if a person would have used it in different language, maybe maybe I'd be like, yeah, that that's a lot of nuance to how this whole system of like addressing homelessness and the nonprofit industrial complex, like this is, this is a really interesting critique. And I, I don't know if that's where the person was going. I don't know if that's not where the person was going. Yeah. I don't know where the person was going, it was just a but these were like babble of, words. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so she's, she's the lawn chair Oracle. And then the last one sadly is not a person who said a thing, but um, I was walking back to work from my lunch break and there was a, a, uh, uh, bus stop bench. So there's a bench. It is uh, metal strips with slats in between. So you, it's not comfortable if you lay down. Yeah. Uh, hostile architecture. And there's trash there. <laughs> there's a, a McDonald's bag. There's a crumpled up uh, wrapper for a McDouble. And there's the little fry holder canister. Oh, yeah. But then inside of that, there's a little candle. <laughs> and the, the candle is lit. And from a distance, there's there's the street, there's the sidewalk, there's the bench on the bench. There's seemingly trash, but arranged in a way that heightens this one element in this candle. So there's, there's kind of an altar what? <laughs> like out of trash. Yeah. And so like someone what does this it mean? It yeah. To make it look like, yeah. Yeah. And I just, I, I just wondered what does this mean? What god is this to? <laughs> yeah. Who who is being the trash? Is this, a, is this a is this is this a ritual or somebody doing a spell to McDonald's? <laughs> I don't know. Hey, McDonald's on more land than the Catholic Church. So holy moly! <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's true. I've heard that. 
don't, don't fact check me, but still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So one of one of the ways that I've been making sense of things that just don't make sense yeah. is to not say, oh, that doesn't make sense. But to say, like, there is something happening here. I like that. And I don't even have the context to fully understand it. Yes. Which I think might end up being true in a way that I don't mean it to. But it does. It, it brings awe and humility back into life yeah. and some wonder and a little bit of fun and well, adventure. Human, I love the humanity aspect, the relational aspect. We're so, we come from the enlightenment, so we're so rational. And so if anything doesn't live in our rational world and we don't, since we don't have to explain it, we don't have to think about it, it's not even real. But that doesn't mean that's not real. Even though we don't have to explain it and think about it, there's someone still babbling about who knows what. And listening to the silence. Yeah, listening. To, and it's like, Sometimes you just got to embrace it and be like, oh, okay, okay. You know, yeah. and, uh, I like that. What wisdom is coming in through the silence? What knowledge is it within the gaps in a sentence? Yeah. And how much are we even listening to silence? Because we're feeding ourselves all the TikTok and... I mean, the know, listener right now is not listening to silence. <laughs> yeah, listening to Go listen to silence, dude. <laughs> yeah, get 20 minutes of that so or whatnot. I uh, love that. What a good way to end. Uh, AJ, thank you so much for thanks so much, Simon. This has been fun. Um, when you come back, we'll do some more. Absolutely. Just pick your brain on any more oracles you found. Where can people, if they want to follow you or find something, I, I open this up for just plug yourself. However you want to plug. It. Yeah, the the two things that I would point folks to is uh, the worm farm that's still in Goshen. Oh, we even talk about that's that. operating. Um, so the worm farm the worm farm operates a community compost service for folks in Goshen who want to drop off at the community farmers market if they don't have space or don't want to or don't know how to compost on their own. Um, they can just take their food scraps there and they get composted. Um, and then there's also a pickup service if you are further than Goshen and you want your uh, your bucket of food scraps picked up. That can happen as well. And we go as far as like South Bend. Um, so post Waste Worm Farm, follow them on Facebook. It's great. Uh, the other thing that I would point to is Safe Place for Youth, SPY. The, that is the organization that I'm currently working with in Los Angeles. They're the ones who do the full wraparound services for youth experiencing um, precarious housing. Uh, and that's who I'm gardening with right now. Uh, so safe place for youth. They're a phenomenal group to donate with or donate to and to follow. Um, and they have a really active Facebook and they have a really active LinkedIn. If you're a oh, LinkedIn cool. girly, I am. I'll go check that out. All right. <laughs> Let's see what that's out. Very cool. Well, AJ, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I'll plug those links in the show notes below for listeners and, uh, very cool. See you next time. Yeah. See you next time guys. Peace. Mm -hmm.